All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, the second BECBC meeting of the year. Hope everyone is safe and well and uh, finding their way through the current lockdown. Uh, the days are getting brighter, though. That's something I've noticed. And uh, we've got to keep looking for the positives, haven't we? Um, so uh, so that's one good sign. Hopefully everyone is doing well. So, uh, so we've got uh, today Stephen Topping and John Rossiter, who are joining us. Um, they are speaking from the Southfield Programme and Project Partners, multi-project procurements. Uh, so we've got a 20-minute presentation from them and then, like I said, in the introduction, we'll have that option for Q&A. So uh, if I can hand across to uh, Stephen and John, uh, you're going to share some slides. Excellent. That's coming through. So over to you, chaps, when you're ready. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, very good morning to everyone. As Andrew mentioned, my name is Stephen Toppin. I'm uh, leading at the moment the uh, implementation of the major, sorry, multi-project procurements, I'll get it right myself. Uh, but my day job is actually as the operations manager for Dusan Babcock in, in lot four of, of PPP. So a bit of a two-man job this morning. I'll let John introduce himself when we uh, get through the presentation. And for some of you, uh, you may already have seen some of the information that we are due to share today. So apologies for that, but hopefully there will be one or two new uh, items that we, that we'll cover, and also today there is the opportunity for some Q and A uh, towards the end there, which was something we've not been able to do in the past. So, yeah, so you might have seen us rounding about. We're on a bit, little bit of a roadshow, getting to different groups and forums to present uh, MPPs. So, just as a, as a, an, an introduction, uh, and again, I won't dwell too much on this. I mean, I, I assume by now, virtually everybody on the call will have heard of the program and project partners at Sellafield the makeup of that with the different lot partners but the reason just to go back over this a little bit and it'll become evident as we go through the presentation is how much the arrangements that Sellafield took and the approach that Sellafield took in putting PPP in place how much that is influencing our thinking when we come to the multi-project procurements and say John will tell us a little bit about about the, the journey and how we got to where we got to and if you look at this in essence we talk sometimes about the four partners we talk about Sellafield as the fifth partner but really we're, we're talking about the sixth partner as well now which is the supply chain of course uh, so you guys and your organisations about being part of that uh, PPP journey. In terms of what PPP is there to do, again, you've probably seen this time and time again. Uh, it's been uh, part of many, many presentations over the period of time. But I did just want to uh, reflect on this because ultimately this is what PPP is all about. Uh, in, in my view, it, it's well about two things really: about creating benefits, about enabling uh, things, both in a direct and in, 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 in an indirect way. So, direct, I'm talking about project delivery ultimately. So, the delivery of the portfolio of projects, time, quality, cost, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, predictability of outcome in doing that. But then, in, in in undertaking those those activities, it's the indirect benefits which are also very very important, and a different way, a different approach, different thinking being applied. So I'm talking about jobs, skills, employment, the community, the environment. Uh, you know, unlocking and enabling those things, which perhaps haven't always been in previous times at the, the forefront of our thinking, but certainly PPP and certainly our approach to MPPs are very much about utilising uh, the collective uh, of, of, of the team to enable and to deliver some of those uh, broader benefits and some of those indirect uh, benefits that uh, are linked in with, uh, with project delivery. And again, just to finish off the introduction, you've probably all seen this before. I think we shared it at our in, in our previous event also. So the, the the portfolio of projects over the next twenty years, and believe it or not, we're already virtually well nearly two years into this uh, PPP journey. May twenty nineteen, when the contracts were signed <clears throat> between uh, the the four partners in Sellafield. and so as you know, projects in flight at that time, which have transitioned to PPP. And as we stand today, we've got five in-flight projects, the first five on that list there. But others now that are, <clears throat> pardon me, 
going through their um, studies phase and will be coming into the project delivery arena in the next one to two years. So I'm talking about things like the, the sludge handling and export facility around uh, FGMSP, uh, the solid waste management uh, facilities around SIGSEP, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so therefore, you know, PPP, we know what the challenge is. We've all seen this before, but how do MPPs play into that multi-project procurement? How do they actually play into this um, this sort of uh, challenge that we've got ahead of us. So with that, I'll hand over to John. Thanks, Steve. Good morning. So yes, brief introduction. My name's John Rossiter. I'm Commercial and Contracts Lead for the Multi-Project Procurement Exercise. So I've been responsible for putting in place all of the various models of how we think we'll achieve what Sellafield are looking to do in PPP. So I'll just give a very quick background about Project 13 and what that means to us in terms of the model we're putting in place and how Sellafield came in. So some of the traditional problems Sellafield have had with their project delivery are not unique to Sellafield, problems across the industry in um, infrastructure delivery. So Project 13 was published by the Institute of Civil Engineers in, in response to industry, industry calls for better models that would deliver better outcomes. So the core theme of Project 13 is a focus on enterprise and not traditional transactional contracting arrangements where one party contracts with another for a fixed scope and it's all about the transaction of that contract. And what we mean by an enterprise is creating an integrated organisation where there's aligned commercial incentives to deliver outcomes. So I'm sure you're all familiar with contracting arrangements where the people at the top table have got a much better deal and perhaps you are further down the chain or it's not a potential win-win scenarios. You can have divisive relationships throughout the supply chain. So the idea of Project 13 is to try and create one team who are all focused on joined uh, aligned outcomes throughout the supply chain and to really drive a true shift in collaborative behaviours and cultures and not just um, say collaboration as a word, but actually deliver it and, and mean it. So that's the focus we've put on our multi-project procurement model. So Sellafield have gone out to that market and been very bold in awarding a 20-year 20 20 year partnership framework. And that's exactly what we're looking to try and do with the supply chain to create that total alignment throughout. Next slide, please, Steve. So how have we done that? So we've looked at all of the procurements that are common across the projects that we've got over the, the next 18 years ahead of us by looking through the procurement plan and looking at the nature of the projects. And we've developed the model and a list of potential frameworks that align to the five PPP critical success factors that, that I will touch on shortly. So the critical success factors, they are Sellafield defined as that is what success looks like for the enterprise. So very much on an enterprise level and not on an individual project or contract basis. So what we've come up with is two categories broadly of commercial models for our multi-project procurements. The first is the one I'm going to talk about most today, which is our key delivery partners. So it'll be roughly 10 in number key delivery partners, and they'll deliver the key elements of construction work. So your civils, steel work, HVAC, electrical, mechanical, and so on. Those key delivery partners are already responsible for end-to-end -end scope or associated with their category of works. So right from early contractor involvement at the very first stages of the project, through design, construction, testing, installation, commissioning, and their works will encompass everything necessary to provide those services. So whether that's providing equipment, procuring pieces of kit and so on. We've then got goods, works and service agreements. So these are more traditional framework arrangements for common, common items that we'll procure throughout the 18 years. So these include things such as construction cabins. So I guess the first point just to mention to this forum today, if you're a local SME or you're interested in supporting PPP, generally our key delivery partners are where the majority of the spend is and that's where if you supply a particular equipment or you provide a particular service, machine and whatever it may be, that would likely be through one of our key delivery partners. Our goods works and service frameworks will be, will be separate frameworks for, for large pieces of kit. Next slide, please, Steve. So it's really important to touch on these critical success factors because this is what we're trying to achieve in PPP. So whether you are the main lot partners or whether you're in a part of the supply chain and you contracted to a key delivery partner or even further down, this is our enterprise focus of alignment. So cost management is achieving double digit savings on a baseline, which again, some people will think is optimistic given project delivery at Sellafield, but the model is structured to set the right baselines collaboratively at the right time. So there's a chance to outperform them. 
CSF2 and CSF5 are very much linked in employment and workforce skills and, and linked to the huge drive on, on social impact in PPP. And these are about creating longevity of relationships throughout the supply chain. So not a 20-year deal for the main lot partners and a six-month deal for SNEs. Long-term long -term investment opportunities for the supply chain. Reduce agency supplied workers. Build the level of skills and workforce employment in Cumbria. Upskill Sellerfield and the supply chain and ultimately support Sellerfield's transformation agenda of leaving a lasting legacy with a supply chain that works at Sellerfield and beyond, so that when Sellerfield shrinks, the wider supply chain capability grows and not, and not at the same time. Next slide, Steve. So I'm just going to touch on the key delivery partner model, as I say, being the bulk of the spend and, and the, main, um, the main area where we're looking to align to, to PPP and Project 13. So the fundamental ethos of the model is profit for performance and that, that, that is flowed down throughout the supply chain. So what we're not looking to do is create a, a supply chain relationship where people further down the supply chain are on high risks, fixed price contracts with, with, um, with particularly stringent commercial terms. We're looking for fair, equitable back-to-back -back contracts throughout the supply chain. Long-term relationships based on the maximum available term. So for our key delivery partners, that's often an 18-year term. So they will join us, as, as Steve said, as, as a partner throughout the journey for the rest of the PPP. And performance is going to be defined by outcomes, not purely trade performance on a project. So what we mean by that is on a traditional project delivery model, the supply chain will, uh, will generally make profits if they can, if they can deliver to the, to the tendered sum and deliver to program, and they'll lose money if they don't. We're looking at taking this up a level. So things like social impact, enterprise, supply chain engagement, we will be absolutely putting profit on those promises and making sure that our key delivery partners deliver what they say they will. And we want our key delivery partners to be either partnerships or include defined supply chain for works in that category for the total duration. I think it's worth touching on here in terms of we've got to be open and honest in that the value of these delivery partnerships are in the hundreds of millions so some up, some are up to a billion over the 18 year period so we absolutely expect that these key delivery partnerships will be led by large companies but that's not to say that that creates a barrier to smes quite the opposite so whilst we expect large companies with the ability to take the level of risk and with the proven track record and the scale and size to deliver these categories we absolutely want to see that SME delivery partners are encapsulated in these vehicles, that they get the same fair and equitable terms, and that they're also given a chance to perform. Early contractor involvement, so ECI is the acronym, is something that's really key. So again, what we're looking to do is we're looking to bring the entire supply chain, the right people at the right time, in early to help PPP build designs, build our budgets and give ourselves the best chance of succeeding against the realistic and achievable budget. Next slide, Steve, please. So I just wanted to show a graphic in terms of how we think the key delivery model will work and what we're really pushing for. So if I, if I firstly talk about the right-hand side, this is a traditional framework contract model. So this is something you'll have seen a lot of times where at the top level, you have your large framework contractor and on a project by project basis, the strategy for how they engage with the supply chain is, is different. Sometimes there might be a, a 1 million pound package for an SME, other times it might be delivered by an affiliate and then you don't ever get that surety of investment throughout the supply chain. It's each time you're competitively tendering for transactional contracts. Moving over to the left side and the key delivery partner model, what we want to see is that whilst there might be a lead delivery partner, we want to see that the local SMEs and the Cumbrian capability is included in the partnership on a long-term basis. So they deliver all of the works in that category and that they'll support PPP throughout, throughout the journey. So a real change in model where we don't want it to be, we, we don't want it to be individual packages that are competed every time. We want long-term investment and security throughout the supply chain. Next slide, Steve, please. So this was something we're quite excited to launch. Obviously, a lot of the questions we've um, we've been asked to date is, well, if, how do SMEs get involved? How can they form part of these key delivery partnerships? And how can we sell, sell the benefits of SMEs and, and what they can do? So we're launching our supply chain matching service. So we believe that PPP gives a unique opportunity for a diverse, robust, and resilient supply chain, which encompasses long-term commitments to local SMEs. As I've mentioned, the reality of end-to-end -end delivery on mega projects is that we will need large organizations, but we've got absolute clear direction that we expect key delivery partners to be inclusive of SMEs with reciprocal commitments. 
So what our supply chain matching service does is if you register your interest at the email address there, there's a performer where you'll be asked for details about your business, the core things that you do, your core areas of work, how you believe you can support PPP, and crucially, what makes you different from other companies out there. So if you're a local SME, what are you doing for social impact? What will you do with 18-year investment? How will you help support the critical success factors of PPP? That information will then be catalogued, and as and when we come to each key delivery partner tender, that will be shared with entities that express an interest and entities that pre-qualify. And as much as we can do, we'll be engaging with directly with SMEs, through the cluster, through other local business groups, to, to try and make sure that we, we really help build those relationships and we, and we put the right companies in touch with the right partners so that we can end up creating a, a long-term partnership that's inclusive of, of the whole supply chain. I think that's, uh, that's us, Steve. So just a quick summary. So key points are we're looking to bring on delivery partners who will deliver the works. We're not looking for layers of management contracting where we'll bring other big companies in and then have a wait and see approach to how they'll tender it. We are excited by the model and we do think it's game changing for local SMEs. I appreciate many of you have heard this before, but we really do believe we've got a chance to do it. And I think the big point is we're not looking for people that are going to be here today, gone in five years after the project. We're looking to empower and grow a competent Cumbrian supply chain for both PPP and beyond. Obviously, lots of the other exciting projects that, um, that we're looking for in Cumbria. And as, as I've said, what we're not looking for is bids from large companies that offer a lot and deliver a little. We, we put in absolute profit against promises to ensure that what we get is what we're looking for. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, John. Thanks for that run through. Just to, just to finish off, noting the, the time before Hayes Laurie steps in and kicks us off. Um, just a couple of things in terms of implementation and, and, and further information. Uh, as um, previously shared, uh, we, we've talked about a number of packages in total, uh, MPPs, that uh, constitute maybe around 30 packages, a subset of which are key delivery partners. We're not going to try and do everything at once, as you can imagine, there's a lot to do. So we will roll it out in tranches or phases throughout this year and into next year. Typically, we're trying to move forward on about four to six packages at a time. And in, in the first tranche, as you can see listed below, we've got HVAC, electrical instrumentation, fabrication, block work, site accommodation. And, and why have we chosen those? Well, driven by what the current projects that are in flight actually need and what's coming in the next one to, one to three years. What are, what are those guys going to need? Uh, strategic importance in terms of long-term success, we, we, we've looked at that and the alignment with the CSFs, etc. And also where we believe there's true opportunities for collaboration and creation of that social value that goes hand in hand with delivery. So that's how we've approached implementation. Um, it's a fairly standard, if you look at the timeline and how, uh, I said how to get involved, I mean, John's explained some of the detail in terms of matchmaking, etc. But we're following a fairly standard approach, you know, an expression of interest, marketing engagement, PQQ, ITT, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and, and at those various points, you know, when we start off at the beginning with interest, yes, it's open to all, it'll be advertised via CTM at the moment. We have just put the first advertisement out about a week or so for HVAC. Uh, we've had 30 plus uh, organizations register so far and then we'll move forward through marketing engagement and this is where the matchmaking starts to kick in the first point at which we will look to enable some of those collaborations to start taking place and that will grow as we move forward then through the through the process. Uh, I've already seen one of the questions come in about multiple awards or single awards. We do anticipate in the majority of cases we'd be looking at multiple awards just because of the size and scale of it. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, expect that to be the case. There are uh, already uh, requirements for early contractor involvement and some of the first call off packages for, for some of the, uh, the items below. So it'll be straight into work rather than an empty framework with the promise of work in the future. And I think most importantly, post contract, this isn't about selecting folks and then, you know, throw them in a room together and say, get on with it. We've got to really think about and invest in how we build the collaborative working arrangements, the performance metrics, the benefits realization that needs to be enabled as we move forward. So I know it will come back and bite me, but I've given you some dates there in terms of uh, what we're looking at at the moment for the first uh, five packages. HVAC is up and running. 
we will be moving towards market engagement in the next week or two. We do expect a PQQ uh, in March time, followed, uh, well, hot on the heels, uh, followed by the, the fabrication and the block work and fit out uh, packages that are coming forward. In terms of further information, we've mentioned Project 13. Do a little bit of search. There is a link there on the um, presentation, but it's quite easy to find information on the Institution of Civil Engineers website, tells you all about it, provides lots of documentation. Uh, some of you, as I already mentioned, may have come to our event a few weeks ago. It was video just like this. It is on YouTube, so there is a link there. It's about an hour long, so if you're struggling to sleep one night, maybe you can try that. But that'll give you a slightly different angle. And I say, a couple of weeks ago, uh, some of our thinking was still developing, but it, it may fill in a few more details. And then everything in terms of communication, please use the PPP supply chain email address. Make sure it's your emails are addressed clearly, marked for uh, as MPP related and marked the attention of Don Keenan. Uh, and I think with that, we're on to, to Q&A. So, Andrew, I don't know if you're going to lead us through this or I'll just deal with the ones that are in the chat already. Uh, yeah, I was going to uh, take the lead on that. Um, first question. Uh, well, in fact, before I go into the question, I think it's worth just pointing out there's uh, several comments been posted in the chat just about how clear that was. So, um, uh, you know, on behalf of the cluster, uh, thank you for uh, for giving up your time this morning to share that information and delivering it with uh, with such clarity. Um, the first question that came through. Um, was from Lee Nicklin. Uh, Lee, I don't know if you're uh, able to unmute your mic. Um, it's just, uh, are there, in part of the 7 billion spend, uh, is it possible to identify what the metal content of that might be? And I was going to ask another question, so I might as well now. And are there any plans to focus on reducing the amount of metal that we use in the uh, NDA supply chain? Because we use a hell of a lot of it. Yeah. So maybe try and uh, deal with your, your first question there. So what we've got at the moment, I mean, those are, are based on long, long range estimates uh, from some parametric modeling that's done with, uh, with Sellafield about the values uh, and the components that make up those, those projects. Uh, so yes, it is broken down, but it's broken down based on a set of assumptions uh, on certain, say, uh, parameters to, to give us an understanding of, of the different um, the, well, the, the different quantities and different aspects that go into those projects. So we do have an idea of that. Um, what goes alongside that, what, what we've been doing work on, is, as you probably know, PPP and Sellafield on the sustainability piece. So there is now a sustainability framework in place, and we'll be very much looking uh, to that to, to help guide and, and support the, uh, the move towards the reduction in um, uh, you know, certain commodities or, or equipment or, or raw material usage as we, uh, as we execute those projects. So yes, we have some ideas, um, Lee, and we will be following the, uh, the principles established in the sustainability framework that's just been recently developed. Thank you. Okay, thank you both. Um, now, Ian Ray, you put a couple of questions in the chat, but I have a funny feeling they might have been answered um, as the presentation went on. Is there anything else you wanted to add, Ian? No, I just want to say thanks. It's almost like I'd uh, got a heads up of the slides before they uh, put them up. Um, but can I just confirm one thing? Uh, the second question I had there around, should we register interest if we can only do one part of a key delivery package? I'm assuming the answer is no. And that we should be registering with the with the matchmaker service. Is that is that right? Yeah, I, I said yeah, yeah. And it, I, I, to us, it's one in the same. I mean, it's the same uh, contact points. And as John mentioned, we will then provide you with the um, with the pro forma to complete for for the matchmaker. So same contact point. Make it clear what uh, what you're, you're you're seeking, what you're registering for. Because uh, clearly you're not going to register for the, the HVAC package, I, I take it, in its entirety. But what you want to do is be part of that. So um, yeah. just just use the, uh, as I say, the contact details there, but make it clear what, you, what you're looking for. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Steve. That's me. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Um, the next question that came in was Stephen Shepherd, But again, I'm not sure if that question's been answered. Uh, Stephen, I don't know if there's any yeah, other... Yeah, you have answered the question about how to get... 
the route to it. But I wanted to ask you a question about uh, collaboration. Are you doing the collaboration in the matchmaking session or are you wanting uh, local SMEs to collaborate and then come to you with a, with a package? I, I just, I'm not quite sure which way you're, you're angling that. Yeah, um, well, I don't know if John wants to comment on this as well, but my, my thoughts at the moment is, is that will come down the line in terms of, uh, of collaboration. Uh, it would be nice to think we could do it as uh, as early as possible in the process, but uh, we we need to see how the you know the market response as part of the market engagement, who's interested, uh, who who wants to have the details shared, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and then we'll move forward with some uh, maybe we'll run some collaboration workshops. It's certainly something we've been talking about when we get into the procurement itself, and we've got a few um, well, there's a couple of organisations and a couple of ladies working with us on that front to uh, facilitate and enable th those sorts of uh, discussions to happen. Don't know if there's anything you want to add on that, John. Um, no, not really, Steve. Yeah, obviously, just just to say, um, there's obviously different types of collaboration. So I think what, what you're saying, Stephen, is you might find two companies where you think you can you could come together and you could potentially bid for one of the packages if you, if you believe that by coming together, you'll have the scale of turnover and the suitability for doing that. So if, if the sort of market wants to do that in the background and, and come together and, and look to form a, a sort of a formal alliance and, and bid, then that's absolutely something we'd encourage. But, but likewise, coming back to sort of Ian Ray's question about if, if, you, if you believe, you, you know, you, have, you can offer benefits in one particular service, but, but you're not quite sure how that fits in, that, that's what we'll try and do with the collaboration to try and yeah, bring, bring together, bring together uh, that's, these players. That's a, that's a good point, because obviously we've seen that in the local press where companies are now collaborating publicly in a position trying to uh, to win work, so it's a question of whether we do that or we let allow you to do that with us. You know, I think you need to you need to do that. I, I mean, one of the things we can't do is you know we can we can gather the information in and we can share that information, but it, but it's not our position to start. I think directing who should be talking to who, who needs to work with who, or or whatever. That's something that that you guys need to. Uh, you know, form your your uh, teams, form your alliances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, I, I understand that, but it, the, for us on the outside, it, it's the packages. We don't know what's in the packages until they actually come out. Obviously, a fabrication package is a fabrication package, but you know, other things where there's machining or whether there's uh, fabrication, machining, assembly, testing, all of that until it comes on, uh, we don't know. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing is, and I think there's a couple of questions in the chat about how, how many will, will it be two for HVAC or whatever there may be for each category of key delivery partner, depending on the total spend, the total spend in the year, the number of consecutive major projects, we'll outline what we think the primary strategy is. So we might say we believe for HVAC, we think we'll have two partners or three partners. Now, they, those partners wouldn't compete for work. And again, I know one of the other questions was that how will work be allocated? Well, it will be allocated based on capacity and not based on on competing for work on a framework but um but when that when that expression of interest comes out that's for you guys the supply chain to look and think well what's our best chance of success is it to join up with another local company and put a joint bid in if we think we can satisfy the requirements of the tender or is it to look to one of the bigger companies and transport them as an sme partner so that's that, that's something that you know, appreciate you haven't seen the detail of packages but as and when they come out that, that decisions for decisions for you to make yeah okay thanks thanks for that you've answered the question thank you all right, thanks everybody. A um, couple more points. Uh, we still have time for a couple of questions. Um, Steve and John do need to uh, shoot off fairly promptly, but if uh, if there are any extra questions just for the next couple of minutes, then happy to take those. Um, uh, one of the points in the chat was, please can the contact details for the matchmaker service be shared to everybody? Uh, I think through the slides that uh, that process seemed clear. The slides will be posted on the uh, the BCBC website, and of course this session has been recorded too, and that will go up onto the BCBC YouTube channel in the coming days. Um, but I think the final one that I can see for now comes from uh, Matthew Taylor. Uh, so Matthew, I don't know if you're able to unmute your mic. Hi, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think John might have just answered that. It was around if you, um, if there's more, more than one key delivery partner per MPP, what would be the, obviously the process of award. Um, you mentioned about capacity. Would other factors come into that? 
Yeah, that's it. So so effectively, if we were to appoint two partners and in, in the contract, it'll, it'll obviously state that we'll reserve the, the right to award and allocate projects as we see fit, but we'll be a set of criteria. So that will be things like if we've got two partners, who's got immediate capacity, what's their core skills versus the projects we've got. So so it will very much be a collaborative process of the side. And when we've got two partners, how do we split the workload between them? It's, it won't be a sort of two partners and you'll both compete against each other for projects like, like certain other frameworks might have been involved with okay i've got i've got another question while you while you're on these if if, if the intention is to tender multiple multi-project procurements um given that there's tranche one tranche two is um you mentioned that, that a lot about this has been the benefits being at enterprise level um how would you kind of get that across to the ppp that if you award multiple MPPs to, to one company or entity, there's obviously potential benefits for that. So where in the process would you be able to, to demonstrate that? Do you mean in terms of saying that if one partner was to be awarded mechanical, electrical and pipe work all as one? Yes. So that, that's something that obviously we've got sort of a cute balance really between, um, and that's exactly the same in our lot strategy as to whether we'll have two partners or one partner. Obviously, it kind of goes without saying that the higher volume of turnover, then, then the more you can deliver in terms of enterprise and social impact. But at the same time, we've got to make sure that we have a resilient supply chain and that we don't have too much too much emphasis on one supplier and we don't overload them and that we and that, and that we keep a competitive supply chain in West Cumbria. So. I haven't got the answer today, but they're the sort of um, they're the sort of criteria we're looking at to make sure that we have that we have the right balance. Okay, thank you for the questions. I can't see any further questions. Uh, so, uh, so thank you, John and Stephen, for for giving your time. Uh, just before you shoot off, let's see if we can bring Ruth back because she was going to introduce you, but uh, she might as well close you out. <laughs> we've got the connection yes hello sorry everyone for a few internet problems earlier very well timed as usual so um thanks very much Steve and John uh, that was a really interesting overview of the PPP structure and um, multi-project procurement channels for the supply chain so thank you again for taking the time to engage with us thanks very much um, next up, we've got um, a reg our regular slot of three by three minute presentations kicked off by Jackie Curry from um, Cumbria Community Foundation talking about the Cumbria war um, war Winter Warmth Appeal, um, followed by Josh Holmes from the local I from local IQ and then Stephen Wood from the University of Cumbria. Hazel is the lady with the egg timer today, so um, I think we should probably make a start with Jackie. Take it away, Jackie. <laughs> And you know, I will stop you after three minutes. So, you, will. you ready? Three, I'm ready. Three, two, one, off you go. Good morning, Jackie Curry, Head of Development, Cumbria Community Foundation. We exist to address disadvantage across our county. We accept donations and we set up uh, grant making funds and we give the money to those who need it. Today, I'm here to talk to you about our winter warmth appeal. Established in 2010, when one man came to us with his winter fuel payment from the government and said, I don't really need this, I can pay my own heating bills, could you give it to someone who does need it? We set up the Winter Warmth Fund. Lots of other people who didn't need the winter fuel payments have donated it, the appeal snowballed. Uh, we've now had over £1.2 million in donations. It's spent in year, we've awarded over 6,000 individual grants. Why do we do it? One in 10 Cumbrians live in fuel poverty. We have lots of old rural homes which cost more to keep warm. We've seen statistics suggesting 300 deaths of old people in Cumbria each year can be attributed to the cold here in our county. People are choosing between heating their homes and eating here in Cumbria. This photograph is a graphic illustration of what I mean. It shows 300 pairs of slippers representing 300 people who die each year in this beautiful county that you also see in the photograph. And here's some of the people we help. People in their own homes, the place where they should feel safe and warm, but here they are wrapped up in blankets and scarves with gloves and hot water bottles in the middle of the day. How do we get the money to where it needs to be? Age UK and Copeland Age and Advice Service act as our delivery partners and distribute the money uh, as they are in direct contact with individuals in need on a regular basis. Uh, grants of up to £250 are awarded to people aged 60 and over. We get a lot of our income from the donations of winter fuel payments, but we also get a good deal through direct fundraising. Here's some examples. The lovely guys at PPM Builders, they have an annual Christmas jumper day and we get the proceeds from that. 
Keswick Alhambra Cinema every year gives us a take-ins from one of their Christmas showings. Even this past year, despite business being so badly hit by COVID, they gave us their Christmas Day take-ins for our winter warm appeal. The Big Sleep, some of you may have heard of this as we ran this for quite a number of years. People were sponsored for sleeping outside for a night in winter to highlight how uncomfortable it is to be cold. We don't run the Big Sleep ourselves anymore, but lots of people do it off their own bat. Cumbria's allied health professionals in the top left photo here slept out in a cave, I believe, that year. Uh, and then in early 2020, they slept out in Carlisle Railway Station, a cold place in the height of summer. Um, what can you do? Organise an event, fundraise an event, do your own big sleep. Uh, you could do a sponsored bike ride or walk. Uh, you could use your COVID exercise slot to do a team walk with everyone clocking up a number of miles to, for example, cover the length of the Cumbria Way. Uh, you could even nominate CCF as your charity of the year for all your fundraising efforts. And that's all specific to the Winter Warmth Appeal, but we do lots more stuff. And we can help companies achieve their social value aims while we all help vulnerable and disadvantaged people here in Cumbria. Call me, email me, details on the screen. Wow, you've still got a bit of time to go. <laughs> there you go. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much Jackie that was incredible um covering all of that information about such an amazing appeal in such a short amount of time so thank you very much again thank you for the opportunity and just <laughs> thank you for those in the chat I've just uploaded a couple of files with uh, a bit more information on the winter warmth uh, appeal and uh, a membership leaflet for Cumbria Community Foundation as well those will go online as well later today for you thanks Andrew thanks Hazel okay Okay, next up we have um, Josh Holmes from Local IQ. Um, a bit of a tough act to follow, but I'm sure you'll be um, absolutely fine and part of flying colours. So um, off you go, Josh. Thank you. I'm going to start my timer right now. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> my name is Josh Holmes. I'm uh, Head of Digital from Local IQ Cumbria. You might recognise some of the brands at the bottom of the screen here. We publish uh, many important uh, news brands across the country, uh, the country and we service newsreaders every single day. But I'm here to talk about us as a digital first business and our evolution along that journey. So the pandemic has changed behaviours, uh, not only our own behaviours internally in our workplace, but also for our clients and even our families. Um, it's pushed for innovation between many sectors across Cumbria and we've seen so many good examples of that. Um, an example for myself is I used to shop at uh, the supermarket for butchers and, and meat and quality meats. I now shop my local butcher. I pay for it online. I order it online. That's something I thought my local butcher would never be able to do. So the point that I'm getting at is the customer journey has stayed the same over time. We follow the same process when we buy products or we think about people we want to work with. But the journey that they go on through this funnel has changed massively. There's now so many different touch points that people can um, experience as they go along this journey. And that's because the way we've innovated digitally and the digital landscape itself has become larger and more complex every single day. So when I think about Cumbria, Cumbria has got a really strong and loyal print audience. We know this ourselves. But what we're seeing is more and more every single day, people utilize the power of online to stay up to date with their news. And we're seeing that in our own figures. We have something called unique browsers, which is how many devices access our websites. And we've seen a 70% increase year on year in these browsers, which is immense growth for us. And it's testament to the service that we provide to our local communities. If you were to take us out of the equation, people like the BBC, Sky News, national brands wouldn't report on the stories that matter to local communities. And that's a fact. So I guess the point I'm getting at now is we're more relevant than ever and we've now got the biggest audience in history at our fingertips. A way to uh, visualize the audience is this fantastic slide for Skittles. So our audience is so big, we can get lost in the numbers sometimes. If you think about our audience as a huge bag of Skittles, uh, there's many, many colors in there, which represents many, many different people who don't live in different areas, have different interests, do different things, and act in different ways across the internet. Now, our advertisers need to get their key messages to their key audience. So with our technology, we're able to take this huge audience we have across Cumbria and further afield and make it into targetable segments, which is demonstrated by this lovely image here of someone sorting out Skittles. It's testament to what we can do for advertisers because it's so important that we tell the correct stories to the right people, especially when we work with commercial partners. We can do this through digital display advertising. We can do it through video advertising, online content, social media, right through to custom campaigns such as PPC and SEO. I can talk about this all day, but I have three minutes and there's three seconds left. So I would say contact with me on LinkedIn or send me an email so we can chat more about your digital future. 
Fantastic time. <laughs> That's it. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that I got it in time. It's the most important thing to me there. That was fantastic. Really, really good. Again, loved the skittle analogy. I think that was a really good um, comparison to make and really got your point across. So Thanks. thank you again. <laughs> so finally, we have um, Stephen Wood from the University of Cumbria. Stephen, if you'd like to uh, step up to the stage and Hazel will start the egg timer going. <laughs> After all those great presentations, not like that was under under any pressure. Uh, well done, Jackie. Well done, Josh. Um, so, right. OK, so I uh, hope you can all see my slide now. I'm sure you're all familiar with the University of Cumbria. What I wanted to do is just give you a reminder that we are here. Um, things have changed as, as far as delivery is concerned for a, a lot of university programs. So I just wanted to give everyone a, a little nudge to say that we are still here. So uh, my name is Steve Wood. I'm the Employer Engagement Manager and I'm based within the Institute of Business, Industry and Leadership. So uh, what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of context in terms of what IBIL does or the Institute of Business Industry and Leadership. Uh, we are our key main areas of delivery around business and leadership, uh, around law, around policing and around project management through the Project uh, Academy. Um, the range of programmes, as you will appreciate, are pretty vast. Uh, everything from undergraduate programmes, CPD programmes, postgraduate programmes and degree apprenticeships. So just to give you an overview of uh, where we are within uh, the University of Cumbria's project management offer um, through the Project Academy, as I say, everything from a, from a one day CPD course through to uh, four year apprenticeship programmes and master's programmes. Uh, we're coming up to five years, 500 organisations and 5,000 learners. So you can see the impact that it's made, particularly within our county. As we stand at the moment, we've got over 300 learners on programme. And again, most of these are in work-related programmes. So we're used to dealing with people who are in that kind of work environment. Uh, in terms of where we are, as far as the project management team is concerned, growing to a couple of years ago, we're now up to 10. And you can see the range of expertise and experience that the, uh, the team have got. But in terms of that learning approach, which is really important, it's about that kind of learning through reflection. So that exper experiential learning is something that we, we are really keen to, to, to demonstrate. And of course, it's not just the academic team who have experience in PM, it's also the, the back office team. So, so many of us within the team also have project management experience and project management qualifications. I suppose the key flagship is the project manager degree apprenticeship, um, delivering now for, for a couple of years, uh, all online, um, we've been delivering it all online now for, for well, since March last year. And you can see there that the, the breadth of, of areas, I won't read through every single area, but you can see it's a really wide program over the three years of academic delivery that we're looking to do. And it looks at leadership and management, it looks at procurement, it looks at scheduling, pricing, costing, etc. So anybody within a PM field that you can see that there is a, a really good, uh, really good scope to learn something here. That red link is detailed. So when you get a copy of that, I can, uh, I can that, that's a link into the page. Um, as far as leadership and management, we've just we've just recruited to the um, senior leader MBA program, but we are also looking to deliver the chartered manager program as well. So anybody who is looking to develop yourself or members of your team as far as leadership is concerned, project manager is a really good opportunity. And you can see here again, a really nice broad qualification. Um, CPD programs, again, we've got a range of CPD programs through the Project Academy, particularly these two programs are what we're looking to actively recruit for now, starting in the next few weeks. Very quickly, uh, open lectures, we're not just trying to sell you stuff, we're trying to engage with the business community to inform us better, uh, and something's just popped up on the screen and I can't move on. Uh, Couple of, couple of options that we have here in terms of programs. Unfortunately, How to Wreck a Project is now full um, and a little bit about learner experience. And I've screamed well over, I do apologize. You have, you have, sorry, Ham. Um, Bail. We'll put those slides up for you later. <laughs> Typical university to bang on longer than necessary. Sorry, just, a, just a few grains of sand over, Stephen, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell Diane I said that. <laughs> Oh, there wasn't a harsh enough dragon there. <laughs> <laughs> we trust you all to keep our secret. Okay. So thank you very much to all of our three, three by three presenters. As always, I think you did a really great job of getting your messages across in such a short time. So thank you very much again for stepping up to the gauntlet for that. So finally, last but not least, I think we'll be passing over to Vicky from the link to give us an update on some of the key school engagement activities that are happening in the area. Is, is Vicky there? Is she having some Wi-Fi problems? I'm, I'm OK at the moment. Hopefully I'll, okay. <laughs> I'll stay on for the duration. <laughs> I've I'll got let you get some on with it in the team. team. So. 
thank you. Thanks for thank that. Thank you. I've just got a couple of slides this morning, which I think Andrew is hopefully going to share for me. So morning, everybody. Um, nice to be back um, with our new name, The Link, obviously, uh, which uh, follows on from its predecessor, the Business and Schools Collaboration Programme. Um, and, and the message today really is to say that our work is continuing just because students are uh, learning from home doesn't mean that we can't help them and there's lots of work going on in the background. It's a really important time of year for our students actually at the moment, particularly for our year 11 who are making important applications at this time. And that might be a sixth form, it might be a college application or indeed an apprenticeship application. So this is a really good time for us to support them with those um, really important choices. Our year eight and year nines are also making choices about um, which GCSEs to take when they return in September. So again, you know, it's a time where we can help them look at the sort of careers that are attached to certain GCSE subjects and how that might influence their choices as well. So we've, we've thought about what would really help Year 11s and uh, normally at this time of year we'd have a careers fair, um, a face-to-face -face, uh, affair which um, is normally really well um, well attended. Fortunately we can't do that this year but we are um, launching just after half term a Year 11 transition series. This replaces the careers fair um, and we're working closely with schools and careers leads to make sure that all students have access um, to the series. It incorporates the um, Shadow Board's AppFit resources and information, um, a number of pre-recorded videos and live chat with Inspira qualified careers advisors, um, as well as some helpful advice from a range of employers. I know I've previously mentioned our year nine support for GCSE option choices, and I'm still taking um, video pre-records and videos um, to help that particular cohort as well. It's no coincidence, I don't think, that it's National Apprenticeship Week next week. It runs all week from the 8th um, to the 12th um, of February. Um, and, and we know, you know, we all know uh, that it, locally um, there's many apprenticeship applications being made this month. So it's um, really important that for the students that they, they get those right. So this is my main ask today. What I'm looking for is some help um, with National Apprenticeship Week. We want to support the week, we want to promote the week and everything that goes on there. So we're broadcasting a number of um, quotes or sound bites from employers. Um, so if I ask you this question, what would your reply be? What do employers look for when recruiting a young person to join their team? If something really springs to mind, if you think when I see young people's applications, I really wish they'd done that, or I'm really looking for this, um, could you drop me a little note or record me a little sound bite, just a little audio sound bite, or you could even just put it in the chat function now while it's in your head, and I'll pick them up um, a bit later. So that's my main ask. Here's my details if you need them. I'm sure you're familiar with them for now. Um, and just a little reminder that um, obviously now we have the funding, we're able to offer this service across the whole of Cumbria. So if you're dialing in from Barrow or Kendall or Penrith or wherever it might be, and you'd like to help your local school, um, I have some opposite numbers now in those areas who could help you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Vicky. Some really great updates there. Um, I hope you've inspired some of our listeners to get involved as well. So um, please don't hesitate to get in touch with, Lick, uh, with Vicky if um, you think you can make a contribution. That would be great. So I think before we pass over to the final networking session, just a few housekeeping announcements for me, as well as a final thanks to all our presenters today. So um, first of all, um, Hazel would shoot me if I didn't remind everyone that membership renewals are now out and about, um, with the email having been sent to the main contact within your organisation. So this will instruct you on how to use the new renewal system through our website for both card and invoice payments. Um, but if you have any queries, please don't hesitate to contact Hazel and she'll do her very best to help. 
Um, secondly, upcoming events. Don't forget the social value group meeting next week. Um, and I've also been asked to mention that the Carlisle Youth Zone and Baines Wilson LLP are inviting people to attend a free virtual business breakfast on the 11th of February with a special guest speaker, John Roberts, who's the CEO of international on online, online re retailer a AO. So all the details for that can be found on the events section of our website. I wanted to say thank you very much again to everyone who's joined, everyone who's presented, everyone who stayed on to the networking session. You know, it really does make these meetings what they are. So um, a big thank you from me. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions and uh, supporting the event. Uh, we'll be back with the uh, the next monthly meeting. Uh, I haven't got the date off the top of my head, in fact. I have uh, should have thought <laughs> of the mouth, but it'll be... 3rd of March. 3rd of March. Of course it will, because we're a 28-day month, aren't we? So um, 3rd of March, we'll be uh, back again. Uh, so in the meantime, stay safe, look after yourselves, and we'll hopefully see you then. Thanks very much.